Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Light Your IRA LLC on Fire with this crypto investing hack. I'm Erica Figueredo. I'm the marketing specialist here at Next Generation, and we have an exciting discussion for you today. But before we get into all of that, I wanted to, to review some housekeeping items, introduce our speakers, and tell you guys a bit about Next Generation. So as always, today's session is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing for anybody that didn't get a chance to make it live. If you are here with us live, you'll be muted for the entirety of the session. But that doesn't mean we don't wanna hear from you, so feel free to introduce yourselves via that chat feature on the right-hand side of your control panel. Um, and if you have any questions during today's session, you can either ask them one of two ways. Um, one, you can just paste something into the chat feature, or there's a dedicated questions tab that you can use. Um, I'm gonna try to get to any relevant questions during today's session. If not, they'll be addressed at the end, and if we don't have any time, they'll be addressed following the webinar. So now to introduce our speakers. First, we have our co-host, John Denza. He is the Chief Commercial Officer at Arisex. John was previously Director of Sales at BATS Global Markets and CBOE and was one of the early founding employees responsible for growing the equities and options franchise business. He has in-depth experience leading and motivating sales teams, identifying strategic product enhancements and navigating evolving market structures. John graduated from Northeastern University with a BA in political science and communications. And second, as always, we have our Director of Marketing and Sales, Brittany Melville. Brittany applies her extensive, extensive experience in direct sales, marketing, and customer relationship management at Next Generation. In her role, she develops and oversees the implementation of our marketing strategy across all media, and works with our team to support sales initiatives. Brittany's accomplishments throughout the years include designing and executing lead generation strategies across multiple channels, developing and nurturing multi-million dollar sales pipelines, enhancing digital marketing outreach, creating educational content, conducting market and competitive analyses, and training, pers training sales personnel and improving internal processes to support sales. And prior to joining Next Generation, Brittany held positions at Convergent Revenue Cycle Management Incorporated and Altria Group Distribution Company, formerly Philip Morris USA. Brittany graduated cum laude with a BS in marketing and business management from Boston College and is a certified self-directed IRA professional, also known as SDIP. Brittany and her husband, currently live in Branchburg, New Jersey with their son. She also owns a rental property at the Jersey Shore. In her free time, she enjoys dancing, working out, playing piano, cooking, reading, and cheering on her unfortunate football team, the Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> <laughs> I so didn't now, realize you were a Boston alum there, Brittany. I went to school at Northeastern. You are too. We have something to talk about later. Yes. <laughs> So now to talk to you guys a bit about Next Generation. Uh, Next Generation is a custodian and administrator for self-directed retirement plans. So these types of plans are exactly like the ones that you'd find at a brokerage account. Um, the only thing that is different is the types of investments you can include within them. So instead of investing in assets that are publicly traded like stocks and bonds, Self-directed IRAs allow you to invest in non-publicly traded alternative assets. Um, our administrative firm and headquarters, Next Generation Services, is located in Roseland, New Jersey, and provides the record keeping and tax reporting services for all of our client accounts. In addition, we provide the educational content that you'll see here today on our webinars, as well as complimentary access to our knowledgeable representatives and other educational content such as our white papers and blog subscription. I also wanna make a quick note that over half of our staff, I think right now, and Britt, you can correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, are certified self-directed IRA professionals. So they've gone through extensive training um, and had to take a test for this designation. So they're definitely knowledgeable and able to answer your questions. Um, 
In addition to that, we also have our white papers and blog subscription, which is free to you on our website. Uh, Next Generation Trust Company, which you'll also see, is located and chartered in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, um, and provides the custodial services for the assets held within our client accounts. So to wrap it up with our very necessary disclaimer on what we don't do, um, Next Generation is not a bank or fiduciary. We do not provide any financial, legal, or tax advice. So any information provided on today's webinar is for educational purposes only. And as always, we encourage you to consult with your trusted financial professionals to determine if this strategy or investment is the right fit for you and your retirement goals. So with that being said, I'm gonna hand the floor over to Britt. So Britt, take it away. Okay, thank you, Erica, for all the introductions. Likewise. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, so today we have a really exciting topic. Um, we have a lot of registrations for today's session. Um, understandably so, cryptocurrency is a hot topic right now. And even more so, I think, is the interest in um, getting it into a retirement account or investing in through a retirement account to get the additional tax benefits. So we're definitely going to talk about that today. We have our amazing expert, John, here with us. Um, I'm going to um, be asking John some questions that we think you guys probably want answered. And in some of the registrations, we took note of what you were looking to learn. So we wanted to, to take that into consideration and try to make sure we, we answered your questions in today's session. So we're just going to be having a conversation. There are no slides. So you can sit back and relax. Um, before we jump in, we're, gonna, we're obviously going to talk about crypto in general. Um, we understand that the um, knowledge background is widely varied on this topic, so we just want to make sure that we also talk about conceptually what is crypto and how it works, and then we'll talk about the IRA component. Before we do that, John, I just want to give you a chance to, um, I know we, we did an introduction on you, but tell us um, just quickly about Arisex and um, your company's role as it relates to uh, cryptocurrency. Sure, Britt, thank you for that. And Erica, thanks for the introduction. So a little background on myself. Um, I've always been kind of in the capital, mar capital market space, having worked at different exchanges, um, being involved in Island, DCN, NASDAQ, CBOE, and BATS over the years. Always in a sales and account management role, so uh, either being focused on equities or options. Um, I would say about five, six years ago, I started researching on, on crypto, and I noticed the parallels between crypto and traditional capital markets, if that being from a routing um, market data standpoint, and then also just ultimately, I, I just believe that the the digital aspect of, of of the asset just I found it fascinating. So I fell down the rabbit hole about five six years ago, and then I was fortunate enough uh, two and a half three years ago to start speaking with the CEO who I had a relationship with at the th uh, previously, and I've been with Arisex for two and a half years now. I started out as in business development and worked my way up into being the chief commercial officer. A um, little background on the on ErisX. So ErisX was founded in, um, I would say about seven, eight years ago. They had come up with an interest rate swap futures product uh, and they were using the CME to clear those futures products because they held what's called a DCO. Um, what ended up happening is we ended up licensing the IP to the CME and we were, we were holding this futures exchange medallion to operate uh, an exchange. And the early investors recognized that for crypto to be successful and, and to take off the way it needs to and have the adoption that it wanted that we should have is there needed to be regulation, transparency, and compliance in the space. People needed to be comfortable with the investment. So what the um, the early investors decided to do from the cap table is one, they decided to grow the cap table, and several different investors came in. Um, some names your your group might um, your user base might know, such as Susquehanna, Virtue, which is a prop trading shop. And then also um, from the uh, minor space, Bitmain, which is a very large minor, one of the biggest in the, in the world, invested in Arisex. Also from the exchange side, CBOE, CME, and NASDAQ. And then the piece that really got me excited was um, having had this capital markets background, you always want to build a healthy exchange where you have the right mix of participants there. People that are helping to drive the prices and provide good execution quality. And then also retail participation that could take advantage of the environment. So in April 2019, we launched Spot Trading for crypto, which is allows you to buy um, one of uh, four different cryptocurrencies. 
And then as the year progressed, we ended up getting our DCO, which allows us to clear futures trades. And then over the next year and a half, we, we kind of focused on getting all the money transmitter licenses so we can support customer business in all the different states, including New York. Uh, and then uh, this last year, we got approved for cash settled futures in addition to physically settled futures from uh, the CFTC. And then um, take us fast forward to today, and I would say the tail end of the year, we've been focused on our margin application, which has been ongoing with the CFTC. So in a nutshell, Arisex is a little bit different than your traditional exchanges that you would deal with. So if you look at a Coinbase or a Gemini, they're strictly focused on spot. If you look at ICE's backed or CME, they're focused on futures. We're different in the sense that we actually marry both. So we have access to spot and futures on the same platform. Uh, and we're also regulated on the federal level. So a lot of the other exchanges don't have that federal regulation. Got it. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. Um, so let's jump into what actually is crypto. And a question that we often get as well is how is it different from precious metals like gold or silver? Yeah, I, uh, great question. So I like to use, just for your audience, I like to use analogies. So think about it this way. If you had, let's say, a gold bar or a gold coin and you went into Starbucks and you wanted to buy a cup of coffee and you put the gold coin on the counter, the person behind the counter would be like, well, what am I going to do with this? I can't break this. I can't divide it into pieces. I can't accept this as a form of payment, unfortunately. It's not practical. Well, think about it in, you know, I know your users probably have downloaded the Starbucks app and they have like a little barcode on their phone that they flash that when they get their latte and it deducts immediately from their bank account. Well, think about it. It's similar to what cryptocurrencies are and digital assets. It's a store of value. So if you it basically have the opportunity, you, if you have Bitcoin in your wallet, um, you can actually do the same thing. You can actually use this digital money to pay for your, your purchases. And it goes out several decimal places that, to the point that it goes out to set fractions of a penny. So over time, as the price rises, you'll still be able to make um, smaller fractional payments that'll be able to support pennies and beyond. Okay. And can you talk to us about, um, we often hear about Bitcoin mining and, and sure. miners that are even my understanding of it is somewhat limited, um, but it seems as though miners are solving some sort of algorithm or like some sort of equation. Um, yeah. What else do they, can you tell us more about how that works and what exactly they do and how that actually impacts crypto? Yeah, sure. So there's there's basically two, two camps when it comes to digital assets. So think about um, either Bitcoin, which is a store of value, or Ethereum, which is a smart contract. So Bitcoin um, is a store of value. You people can see it increase in price over time, and it could be used to purchase goods and so forth, as I mentioned to you before. So the role of the miner, basically what happens is, is there will only ever be 21 million uh, Bitcoin ever created. So that's one of the, it, it's the, the supply and demand. There'll always be a limited supply of, crypt, of, of Bitcoin ever created or mined. And over time, what happens is it's like a bell curve so that over time, every certain amount of years, there's what's called a halving event. So right now, I think a couple of years ago or about, I should say, I should say a couple of years ago in May, there was a halving event. So where people were getting 12 and a half Bitcoin, it moved to six and a quarter. What does that mean? It means that all of these miners are competing to solve a very complex equation. And every 10 minutes or so, that equation is solved. And the person who solves it first is rewarded with um, the Bitcoin. Right now it's at six and a quarter Bitcoin. And then to take it a step further, the other role of the miner is to actually uh, approve transactions on the network. So if I had a wallet, a digital wallet with my crypto in it, my Bitcoin, and I wanted to make that payment at Starbucks, that movement from my wallet to the Starbucks wallet goes out on the blockchain, the network. And the miner actually is the one that approves um, that transaction. So to roll things back for your audience, they're probably curious, well, what is blockchain? And I think one of the easiest and simplest analogies is, think about if your users were gonna be on an Excel spreadsheet where your updates to that Excel spreadsheet are dynamic and the whole world can see them and access them. And then when you make an update to the spreadsheet, it's immutable so that nobody can change or alter what you've done in the past and everybody can see those updates on the blockchain. 
that's it in its simplest form. It's just, it's considered, it's also called distributed ledger technology. Think about it, everybody has access to what is going on. And when they make updates to the blockchain, they're immutable. You can't change them, you can't break them. Um, and then to, to go back to your comment about uh, the different types of cryptocurrencies, there's what's called smart contracts, which everybody, your, your audience has probably heard of the concept of Ethereum, which is another coin. Um, to kind of go back to what I was saying of how I try to use the, you know, real life scenarios to describe situations. Smart contract means in its simplest terms, if then, if I do this, then this will happen. So think about it. If we take it to a step where you, I, I to use this as an example, you have a vending machine and one is, you know, you want to purchase the KitKat bar that's in the vending machine. Um, the KitKat bar is $1.50. I put it four quarters into the machine. I hit A3, nothing happens because I didn't complete the task correctly. If I put the dollar six quarters in, I got the $1.50 there, I hit the A3, boom, the KitKat falls down. Well, it's as simple as that. If this happens, then this will happen, an if-then statement. So that's it in its simplest term. And then when you look at the smart contracts, smart contracts are a little bit different than the miners where each of the people on the network have what's called a node. And those nodes actually vote on different directions of what's going to happen on the network in its simplest form. I know I covered a lot of ground for your audience there and hopefully it wasn't too technical. Yeah, no, that's all. And I actually didn't realize, I don't know about our, our listeners, but I didn't realize that Bitcoin and Ethereum operate differently. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that Ethereum was a smart contract. I thought just these are different currencies, you know, you invest in them or you purchase or whatever and use them all the same way. I didn't really understand that they had different functions. Um, and then the, when you talk about blockchain, um, it sounds like there's a level, so there's a level of transparency um, as far as a record of what has taken place on that, I guess, ledger or Yep, distributed ledger technology, DLT. <laughs> um, and but I, I've also heard that there's some level of anonymity. So is it that you can see what happened, but you can't necessarily trace back to who did what? It's a great question. So there is a level of anonymity. You might not know who is on the purchase, but what I think is a misnomer is that some people think that the that trading cryptocurrencies has this negative connotation with bad actors and nefarious actors working on the network. Yes, there's been stories of bad people that have, have transacted on, on cryptocurrencies, but it's the same thing with money. We've got people that have actually done things with money and washed it through the system. And I find it for your users, it, it, there's actually software companies now like a, a chain analysis or elliptical where that's exactly what their business is, is it's actually able to track down the movements of all of the, the movements of coin on the network, the blockchain. And that's what's great about it in a sense, because think about it, you can actually trace movements of coin to different places. So in previous, let's say, hacks or threats that have happened to different organizations, they're able to chase that down. So think about recently with the pipeline hack and how the US government gave the ransomware of the Bitcoin, and they actually were able to find those actors because of just like what I said, there's software and tools out there that make it a safe asset class because you could track the movements easily on the network. Got it. Okay. That's helpful. Um, and I guess on that same vein, how can crypto exchanges ensure the security of clients' assets? There seems to be, and maybe it's just due to limited education on some of this still, um, it seems like it's for some people, it's sort of like in its infancy of developing and for others, maybe not so much because they've been involved in it for years, but we're all kind of coming at this from different levels of understanding. Um, and maybe some of the limited knowledge has uh, contributed to this hesitancy about security and regulation and that sort of thing. Can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. I think there's a combination of different tools that are that are at the the whim of, of the of the exchanges that, that's at their fingertips. So one of them is the different types of wallets. So there's there's what's called hot wallets, cold wallets, and warm wallets. Um, you know the the cold. Let's say the hot wallet. Hot wallet is when you know you have funds maybe um, immediately about to go and leave the exchange. So you, it's a less secure wallet, but it's secure. It's just not to the level of the cold wallet. So there's that. Then there's this kind of middle ground where there's a warm wallet where 
If somebody's trying to make a deposit, they might be in this, this middle ground of security. And then the most secure out of all of them is cold storage. And in its, you know, what that basically means is your coin is completely offline. So nobody can affect it at all. So people can take it either, let's say, um, what could happen with an exchange is they could take that coin, put it into cold storage, and that cold storage could be maybe it's on a, a computer device that's only used for accessing that coin, and they might actually take it in some places do this. Well, they'll put it in a vault somewhere at a bank where nobody knows where that bank is. And if they want to access that coin, I, I know certain custody providers where they'll put them in an Uber, send them down to the bank, and then find a way to plug into the network and then eventually get it offline. And then there's personal use. There's other vendors out there, um, even like a ledger, where it's a little thumb drive, where the retail participant, what they could do is if they have a transaction on the exchange, if they want to take it offline for their own benefit and put it in their safe, they put the thumb drive in, they move it to this new wallet, and then it's completely offline. So there's that level of security. Also from an exchange level, what, you, you know, what some exchanges have been pursuing and other um, banks and so forth is, there's this term called a SOC 2. Um, this is basically, you're going through an extensive review by an outside group, uh, looking at all your security measures. Um, to, in its simplest terms, I have here, the, the, the categories that they look at are security, availability, processing, integrity, confidentiality, and privacy. So when somebody gets approved for a SOC 2, it's a pretty big deal because there's a significant amount of work that has to go into this. I would say it could take anywhere from three to four months of prep for an exchange or, or a bank or a software company. And then they actually go through the testing, which could take another three to four months. And when you come out the other side, you're going to get this SOC 2 approval. And then when institutions and retail are looking or considering who to transact with, that's a huge plus because it shows that we've done the rigorous work to be a protected venue. Okay. And then there's also other things like 2FA, uh, security, where you could actually get a, a special key to log in. There's levels of uh, password protection and so forth. But we could go we, we could go far and wide if we wanted to talk about security in uh, in crypto. Yeah, we could probably do a whole other webinar on that. Yes. <laughs> um, so, how do exchanges? Because it seems that um, all exchanges are a bit different, right? Um, like the Coinbase's of the world and the Gemini's, as you said, and then of course you have RSX. How do you determine what cryptocurrencies to offer and and why? Considering there are variations in in which exchanges offer some and not others. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a most exchanges have a, a you know stringent or you know very strict listing policy. There's multiple factors that they're going to look at. Um, one of them being is this kind of a flash in the pan coin that just today is gonna to be here and gone tomorrow? So we're definitely looking at longevity. We're looking at the health of the projects. Um, another piece that's key is, is it's centralized. So if your users have ever followed what's been going on with XRP, you know the SEC stepped in and there was a concern there because that you know XRP is kind of acts centralized in the sense that the decision-making on the coin and the release of additional coins are done by XRP itself. It's not using that approach, like I mentioned before, that decentralized approach with the different nodes voting on the network. They control all the voting rights themselves. And that's why the regulator raised the red flag and they wanted to dig deeper into it. And then there's things like, um, I would say a, a major factor is, and it kind of goes to the XRP and the centralized nature is, does the SEC view it as a security? And that's why they're questioning what's going on with XRP. And then there's other things like, um, uh, we're approved for our bit license. New York has uh, what's called a green list of approved um, tokens that are allowed to be traded in the state. So we're gonna look to that as well. And then there's other things too. There's, everybody's on different protocols. So you wanna see, is it, a, is it an adoptable protocol that you can actually code to easily? Um, will there be mass adoption? You know, There's reputational impact, short and long-term demand. There's a long host of, of items, but usually what happens is, is that if you go through all these criteria, then it's gonna probably go to your risk committee at that exchange. They're gonna look at it and review it. And then if they make a decision, it'll probably go to your executive committee. And then finally, they'll move towards listing the coin. Okay. Um, so I imagine that understanding that 
security or level of security would be especially important too. I know we're going to talk about IRAs today. <laughs> and when we think about investing retirement dollars into something, um, it is typically a long-term uh, play. Um, so having some understanding of that would be especially important when thinking about retirement accounts. Absolutely. I mean, that's the, the beauty of, of the retirement account itself, right? Is you're going to be, you're looking at this long-term view and the potential upside that could happen in some of these digital assets. And I'm not a tax expert, but the fact that you're deferring it to when you'd be eligible to, to release, you know, release the funds within your IRA, it's pretty amazing that you could have this growth over this period of time and have the tax benefits. Absolutely, absolutely. So if someone is looking to go this route and they need to select an exchange, what are some of the criteria or what are some of the factors that they should be evaluating when looking at exchanges? It's a great question. So I would say that one of the most important is customer service. I think that what happens with a lot of the different venues is you find yourself because they've grown so fast that it's almost difficult to get through to their customer service desk or their client service team to ask them simple questions or there there's long onboarding times because they're just they don't have the capacity to support the demand so i think it's important that when you're considering a destination you want to work with a group that's going to be available and that you can pick up the phone and ask them a question instead of getting the bot online or hopefully sending an email and wishing for the best that you're going to get an answer. Um, I think also what I, your users should look for is fair and transparent pricing. If you look at some of the fee schedules out there by the different exchanges, they're very convoluted and confusing. I mean, I'm in the industry and I read some of them and I'm shaking my head and wondering, you know, do I have to stand on one foot and, and hold my other hand up in the air and then maybe I get this price point? It, it's very confusing to somebody who's new to the industry. The other part is is regulation. You want to be trading on a venue that you feel comfortable and safe on. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're on the federal and state level. We're regulated. You're going to want to look at that as well when you're dealing with the destination because there are certain requirements put on them that other places wouldn't, like routine audits that the state or federal could come in, do an audit, question, and that's really important. You want to feel safe with the, the venue. And then lastly... I, it, it comes down to the team, you know, some, you know, I, I never wish anything negative on anybody, but, you know, do you want a team that might be focused strictly on technology or do you want to work with a group that has capital markets experience that is trying to take the industry to the next level? And I think that that's, what's important. If you're going to, if crypto is going to reach those other levels, you almost have to pull some of the concepts and the compliance and transparency from traditional capital markets and lay it over um, crypto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's um, uh, customer service is, is certainly something that we also place a lot of emphasis on, um, especially Absolutely. in today's today's marketplace. Um, there's that fine line between um, giving your users options to communicate in the ways that they prefer, but always having that ability to connect with somebody. Um, and to get the guidance that you're looking for, especially when someone's holding your money or investments. Um, you do not want to feel like you can't get in touch with someone or you have to wait hours to hear back or days to hear back. Uh, so that's, that's definitely important. Couldn't agree um, more. You, you mentioned math adoption. Did you, did you cover everything that you wanted to talk about? on math Yeah, adoption? I think um, just for your audience, I think when I refer to mass adoption, I just... There's so many things going on in the space that shows it's moving in the right direction up and to the right. And I think there's also this misnomer that people say, oh, there's this volatility and these wild gyrations in the market. I don't feel comfortable getting involved. And I always like to refer to, let's look at the price movement of Tesla or from March, uh, I, I should say, of 2020 to, to where we are today. You know, We saw basically the price of Tesla go from $85 to February of 2021 reaching um, technically $4,000 if you're not going to account for the split. So that's a 47x increase in value over that period of time. If you're going to compare that to uh, you know where the price of Bitcoin has been, it's moved from 6,300 in that March of 2020 to a price of just under 60,000 roughly. That's a nine and a half x. So when people are concerned about volatility and the movement and so forth, 
I like to, you know, if you're going to stack the two against each other, obviously Tesla and some of the other equities that have been traded also have these wild gyrations that far outweigh what's happened with, with uh, crypto and Bitcoin. And then mm -hmm. there's other pieces too. I, I find that um, you know, people should look at some of the, the mass adoption from the institutional community. You've got Fidelity being involved in crypto, which is just a tremendous name uh, and brand in itself for the industry with trillions in assets under management. Um, you've got Mass Mutual, traditional insurance person group that's buying 100 million in crypto a couple, you know, a couple months back. You hear these stories about Michael Saylor and Michael MicroStrategy constantly doubling down on their investment in the crypto space. I think that they've acquired recently now $2.2 billion worth of crypto. So there's this mass adoption from the institutional level. And then also even looking at it from the banking community, you've got Goldman Sachs starting up a crypto trade desk, Morgan Stanley's high net worth clients being able to access products now that are focused on crypto. And then even like a BNY, which is the largest custodian in the world with 41 trillion in assets under management, saying that by the end of the year, they're gonna custody coin for their institutions. But with all that being said, I think that the real pivot point that just speaks volumes to where this is going is if you look at the pay, PayPal got involved in crypto six, seven months ago, and prior to PayPal's involvement in crypto, there were only 100 million digital wallets ever created where people could put crypto in their digital wallet. Overnight, 350 million people now had access to crypto. So we just three and a half X the available wallets overnight to people that want to access this new burgeoning asset class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good points. And obviously, everybody has different risk tolerances and, and that sort of thing. Um, but it's it seems to certainly be an intriguing time for crypto. And based on what's been happening and the way things are moving, it'll be very it'll be very interesting to see what the future looks like for crypto. For sure. I agree. And then I, I think also for your audience, too, is City and Guggenheim have put out estimates on where they believe that the price of crypto is going to be moving in what direction. And it's pretty amazing if, because I touched on earlier, the limited supply of Bitcoin being at uh, you know 21 million ever created and minted, think about it. So then what happens if, if everybody decides to put a small portion or two to 3% of their portfolio into crypto? Well, it's gonna drive the price. And these mm -hmm. estimates that have been given by some of these, these analysts that they've put out there and they're on, you know, out on the web and public is anywhere from three to 400,000 for a Bitcoin in the future. Do you have any other um, comments that you wanted to make on crypto in general that we didn't we didn't ask you about? No, I think uh, I think I covered a lot of the basis. Um, would love to, to switch the, the discussion around and we'd love to get your perspective on on the space. So I know that um, we talked about how crypto can be held and purchased through a self-directed IRA. Um, I think it would be helpful for the, the audience to know what the different options are. Sure. Um, so until relatively recently, uh, the the primary option was in order to hold crypto in a self-directed IRA, it needed to be done through what's called an IRA LLC. So in that case, essentially what would happen is someone would open a self-directed IRA. Um, they would fund it by either rolling over money from an old employer plan or like a 401k, or if they have an existing IRA with another custodian that's not holding crypto, they could liquidate some of their assets there and transfer cash to their new self-directed IRA. Um, and once their IRA is open and funded, they would have to establish a newly formed LLC uh, in which the IRA would technically be the member of the LLC and the owner. Uh, and then by listing the account holder, the investors themselves as the actual manager of that LLC on the operating agreement, it would give them access to the businesses, the LLC's business checking account. So all of that um, is a way to do it because by having access to the business checking account, you can then establish a digital wallet and link your checking account to that wallet um, that would essentially be holding IRA funds. But because of that, what we call checkbook control, where the account holder has that manager access to the bank account, they would be able to go in and 
you know, they could even set it up on an app like, you know, or an app that would that would be tied to an exchange where they can do that, you know, the trading. Um, so that up until recently was the only option because um, so most self-directed IRA companies, including next generation, don't directly custody crypto. It's a whole nother, whole nother animal that we, um, at this point in time, we're not necessarily um, looking to get into. Um, but we have now offered or introduced a second option um, without requiring that IRA LLC, uh, which is just a direct investment option. So. Um, I know we can say that obviously Arithex is is uh, the third party that we that we also work with to offer this option to our clients. Um, so the direct option, if we want to call it that, is to um, do what I described earlier by setting up the new self-directed IRA, funding it through that rollover or that transfer, or making a contribution in cash to the IRA, and then essentially once that IRA is open and funded with the custodian. Uh, setting up that crypto account with a third party, um, like you guys, John. Um, so once that's set up, then the custodian would, um, by following the investor's instructions, take funds out of the IRA and then send them over to the, the third party. And then the, uh, the IRA holder would then work with that third party to um, authorize you know, any trades or any other transactions. And then um, because it is a closed loop system, if that if those assets are sold or liquidated, um, then the cash would come back into the IRA, and then it could be reinvested or redeployed back into other, you know, other investments. So, um, so there are those two options now. Um, we found that the direct investment option uh, tends to be more convenient for those individuals who um, maybe they're starting out a little bit smaller, like they, they're not ready to you know, dump six figures into this yet, um, but they wanna to set up something to get started. Uh, and that tends to make more sense for them because the LLC route um, is gonna come with additional expenses, right? So setting up an LLC um, comes with a cost, maintaining an LLC comes with a cost, and especially with an IRA LLC, um, we require that it be set up with an ERISA attorney, which is a specialized attorney that is versed in um, certain regulations. So there's there's costs associated with that. Um, so it's, it's basically taking out steps, uh, eliminating steps in the process, and eliminating the need for that extra cost. Um, another thing that could be perceived as a potential benefit is that doing the direct investment option, um, the pro of, of doing that is allowing that self-directed IRA custodian to have more oversight into transactions that are taking place and value, um, you know, real-time updates and value. I shouldn't say real-time, but regular updates and value um, on the assets that are being held. Whereas with the IRA LLC option, essentially what happens in that case is the custodian will process the transaction for the IRA to invest in that newly created LLC. But then after that LLC is funded and the investor is kind of using that checkbook control and working the checking account, um, custodian doesn't have regular oversight on what they're doing, on um, regular transactions that they're doing. So with that freedom, of course, comes responsibility. Like they say, with power comes responsibility. So with the flexibility to have the checkbook control, you then have the responsibility to make sure that as an investor, you are following IRS guidelines and you're not doing anything that's perceived to be prohibited by the IRS. Um, and because you don't have that regular custodial oversight, there's probably a greater risk of doing something prohibited. Whereas like we said with the direct investment option, it's a closed loop system. So it's much less likely that funds are going to leave that account and go somewhere that they shouldn't, um, if that makes sense. It's perfect. Well said. Um, do you have any, I know that you have experience working with IRA holders. Um, do you have any insights that you'd like to share and 
your experience and, and the process? And how I you guys mean, do it? I think we've, we've tried to simplify it as much as possible so that when you know a new user wants to have access to an account, we have an exchange member portal that they come in, they log in, and then they go through a simple group of steps uh, and questions, including KYC questions. And at the end of that, they're gonna ask, we're gonna ask you who your IRA provider is, and then you're gonna be able to bring a packet back to Next Generation Trust. And then for those that want something a little bit more sophisticated, like on the LLC front, <clears throat> if you send an email to RSX with your request, what we'll do is we'll send you a DocuSign um, agreement of our, our entity agreement. You would review it and execute it, and we'd get a copy back to Next Generation Trust as well. And then um, for those that do get onto the platform, uh, once they are there, they have the option of two trading um, interfaces, one through a quick trade ticket where, hey, I've got $5,000. I want to buy as much Bitcoin as possible right now. Boom, I hit the button, tells you how much you would purchase, and then next step would be to hit the enter and acquire it. And the other piece would be um, the trading UI, which is a full-blown trading UI with charting and time and sales and so forth. So it gives you optionality between the both of them. Right. And then reporting flows back to um, us, for example. So um, we can see kind of on a, with some level of frequency what's being held and, you know, updated value. Um, so that we can also do proper tax reporting on the IRA. Um, but of course, as long as the assets are being held in the IRA, they're not subject to tax. Um, so obviously that's one of the benefits of holding them in the IRA. Um, and then if someone did want to liquidate, um, they would simply sell off their, um, their assets um, and then they would, uh, that cash would go back to the IRA and then they can take a distribution from that IRA for personal use, um, or of course, if they wanted to transfer that cash back to like a Fidelity brokerage account and do something else with it and get back into you know public securities, they're free to do that as well. So there's all that flexibility, but um, as long as the proper channels are being followed and everything's being documented correctly, which is why um, you know working with a custodian and working with an exchange that understands IRAs as well, and some of the rules and regs and you know what not to do um, is I would consider best practice for doing it successfully. I agree. Yeah, and just to add to what you were saying before, we're we're providing monthly statements for tax purposes to next generation trust so they have an insight into everybody's trading activity where we have a shared user. Right. Okay. Um I think that covers all the questions we had. John, did you have any other questions for me? No, I think we're good. I'm excited to work with Next Generation Trust. Likewise. Um, Eric, I guess we'll flip it back to you. I don't know if we have any questions from the audience or anything else that um, you wanted us to cover. Um, I think you guys did a great job. Uh, we don't have any questions as of right now. Um, I do want to leave that open though. So if anyone is on and wants to ask a question, um, please paste it into the chat or into the questions tab. Um, we'll kind of hang out for a minute and see if anything comes in. Otherwise, um, hopefully everyone came here and got what they needed. <laughs> um, I have actually, um, if I can, I just, I thought of a question that might come up. Sure. Um, and it's probably one that we could answer together, I think. But if someone, let's say someone owned crypto in their IRA and then they decided they wanted to take it personally, but they didn't want to liquidate. So essentially taking a, a dish, like distributing it to themselves, if that makes sense. Um, so that the ownership would be, <clears throat> re-registered from the IRA to them personally. Um, I think we briefly talked about this last week and I, I think there were certain circumstances under which that could be done mm -hmm. and then others where it would have to be first liquidated. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot here, but No, the way. no, I'm, I'm good with answering the <laughs> so, question. I think I know where you're going? going. Okay. Yeah, so, so there's, we touched on the whole concept of a closed loop system. So the closed loop system for the direct participants means exactly that. So when the flow, the, the, the monies 
from ACH or Wire are sent in from Next Generation Trust for that account, then they would be able to trade on behalf in that account that we created. But they'll never be able to withdraw the fiat or the coin from the account. It's closed loop. So you purchase, you ho we hold it for you in our custody. You decide that you want to sell out of the position, you sell out of it, and the money flows back to Next Generation Trust. For those that are looking for something a little bit more robust, what you can do is if you have your LLC account, um, what we're planning to do in the very near future, and we have legal approval to do right now, is allow and permit the withdrawal and deposit of coin into the account. So if somebody had in an app with an LLC account purchases Bitcoin on ARSX and they feel more comfortable taking it offline and using, let's say, like a ledger device that I used to mention before and they want to take it offline, they have that option, but that's only presented to those who have an entity account. If they have the entity account, which is an LLC, then they have more freedom because you know, a lot more of the responsibilities are put onto the end user itself. So there's mm -hmm. two different options. And then also, if somebody has um, coin in a, in a wallet at another exchange, and if it's in the name of Next Generation Trust, what we can do, and we're working on this right now, and I have approval to, is they could roll or move that that coin because it's in the same trust provider from that exchange to ARSX. If it was in an exchange with a different provider or it wasn't in an, I, an IRA account, they would actually have to um, technically liquidate, roll over the funds into Next Generation Trust and then make the purchase. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of of options here, um, both from uh, moving the actual asset around, like custody of the asset itself, and methods for setting this up in the first place for the investor, depending on what what's important to them and what they're comfortable with. So there are, um, for those who are new and learning about this, obviously, um, the important thing is just understanding your options, uh, feeling good about really understanding what your options are, the pros and cons of either or, uh, and then deciding for yourself which is the best fit for you. So there are definitely um, definitely a couple ways to do it. Um, one thing I would add, because we touched on a little bit on what not to do as far as if you have crypto in your IRA and you've been, you, you purchased it through an exchange, you um, you don't want to be taking that out and just, uh, you know, taking it out yourself, right? You don't, or you don't want to be just like without consulting anybody, moving it out of that account into a personal account, right? Because remember, we're talking about um, assets in a in a qualified account, in a a tax advantaged account. So when you have investments in a tax advantage account, um, if you move them without going through the proper channels into your personal custody, the IRS is going to assume that it's taxable. Um, and the idea behind going this route and using the strategy is to either defer tax on all your earnings, or if you have a Roth IRA, you could completely avoid having to pay tax on your earnings altogether, which is pretty powerful. Um, but only if um, you understand the rules and regulations and, of course, relying on uh, a custodian to guide you through that process and, and educate you on best practices is important and making sure that you do that successfully. Um, the other thing that has been brought up in the past or has been asked um, by some investors is, well, I already have, you know, I'm personally already invested in crypto um, and I have an account um, in my personal name, can I just, you know, combine, can I just add my IRA's investments into that account? Um, and the answer to that is, again, no, because anything that's taxable versus non-taxable has to be completely separate. So you would need to create a separate account specifically for the IRA. And then of course, keep your personal investments completely separate. Um, and you can, of course, do both and do both very successfully, but just keep in mind that anything owned by the IRA um, should be documented separately from the other. So I just wanted to touch on that because it's one of those things that people might not necessarily think about, um, but because we're so trained to think about avoiding any sort of taxable event, 
and our mission is really to uh, avoid uh, taxable events for our investors. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Yeah, I think it's pretty powerful what you could do with the Roth IRA if you're investing in crypto and deferring that or not having to pay taxes oh, yeah. because you already paid those taxes up front. And uh, yeah. it's it's really a powerful tool. For sure. Okay. Um, we actually have a couple of questions, um, one of which I'll address myself. Uh, Rashid wants to know if the session is being recorded. He just joined. So Rashid, yes, it is being recorded. It'll be available on demand. And we will send out an email tomorrow to all of the registrants with the recording so that you can either view it again if you want to um, or watch it if you haven't already. Um, but the one question that did come in was from Jennifer and she wants to know um, if she wants to proceed with a crypto investment with an IRA, what are her first steps? So Britt, I'd like for you to maybe touch on the process a little bit and perhaps sure. some of the timelines associated with the process. Sure. Um, so Jennifer, you would typically start with establishing a self-directed IRA if you don't already have one. And that would start with speaking to a custodian uh, like Next Generation, for example, um, about what type of account you'd like to have. So even within self-directed IRAs, you can, as John had said, you can have a Roth. Um, you can also have a traditional. If you're a business owner, there are other types of IRAs designed for business owners. Um, so you would first want to decide on the type of IRA that you're going to self-direct, and then you would fill out an application with your custodian to set that up. Um, we do everything pretty much electronically, so it's all through DocuSign to just make things easy for everyone. Um, and then as part of that conversation, you would also want to determine how are you going to uh, get cash into your IRA so that you can start investing in that crypto. So that's typically going to be driven by how much do you want to start investing with or depending on what you're buying, is there a minimum investment required? But that's completely um, driven by the investment itself or up to you what you're comfortable starting with. Um, and then we typically have a conversation about, okay, um, what retirement accounts do you have currently, if any, and where are they held, and what types of accounts are they? So we can talk about the options for how to move funds over to the newly formed self-directed IRA. So whether it's a transfer or a rollover, um, or if you don't have any retirement accounts and you wanted to personally make a contribution in cash to get started, that's also an option. So Everyone's situation is a little bit unique and different, so that's why we would have a conversation to get a better appreciation for your circumstances and what you currently have. And then once the um, IRA is established um, by filling out that application, which just takes about one or two business days, um, our transactions team would walk you through the process for getting the funds moved over. So if it's a transfer, for example, they're gonna uh, send a transfer request to the other institution. Um, if it's a rollover, they'll they'll tell you what's required for you to initiate that on your end and just guide you through each step of the process. Um, and then at that point is where um, a company like Arisex would come in and then what we would do is link everybody together and then um, you would complete the application. It's just a second set of paperwork to set up um, a crypto account for your IRA. And then I guess, John, if you want to um, add any detail in there, I mean, I know we typically will um, we'll send the funds over to you guys. Um, and then from there, you would work with the investor. Absolutely. So um, once you, you log into our website, there's a, a page there that you would go through the steps for onboarding. Um, there are a couple different thing, pieces of information that, that we're going to require including uh, some KYC questions too. And then once that's completed, then um, you would select Next Generation Trust and you would actually have the membership packet that you would take back um, for their review. And then once everything is said and done, we would actually give you access to the Exchange Member Portal. And that Exchange Member Portal will give you the quick trade ticket and also the ability to use the trading UI. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you can either wire or ACH your funds into your account. And John, um... I think I remembered um, seeing that that UI is accessible by uh, mobile or desktop. Is that correct? That's correct. So you'd be able to access the trading UI through the desktop. And then um, we haven't necessarily created an app for the UI yet, but it's actually perfectly sized to be used on your phone. Great. 
<laughs> Hopefully that answers the question for Jennifer. Okay, I was muted. Yeah. Story of 2021. <laughs> um, so we have a couple more questions um, that I think we have time for. Um, I think that they're going to be directed for John. Sure. Um, so Rashid also wants to know who holds the private keys to the crypto and is there a limit on how much you can invest via a self-directed IRA? Um, he mentioned something about Coinbase um, that had announced something similar. Um, I think that they said 5%, so he wants to know if there's anything um, that he might want to be aware of. Yeah, so um, the private keys, great question. So when we talked about the closed loop system earlier, with the direct um, members participating on RSX, we eliminate the need for having to actually have those private keys because we keep custody of the coin on RSX, so we do not release the private keys. If you were to go down the path of the LLC or a solo 401k or, or another different entity, you would actually then have the ability to withdraw the coin and we'd give you the private keys and you could move it to your own personal wallet. And then what was the second part of the question too, Erica? If there were any minimums on how much he would be able to invest via a self-directed IRA. Uh, there are no minimums for RSX. I don't know, Britt, is there minimums for, for Next Generation Trust? No, because by nature these accounts are self-directed, uh, it's completely up to the investor to determine how much he'd like to invest. So mm -hmm. it's flexible. Perfect. Okay. Well, that was a great session today, guys. We had a lot of good questions. You guys covered a lot. Um, hopefully there might be a part two of this down the road. I'm sure that crypto is going to be advancing. So there's definitely going to be things that we'll need to cover, um, but that's it for today. So thank you, John. Thank you, Britt. Um, and thank you to the audiences that joined um, and we'll see you next time. Thank Thanks, you, Erica. Thanks, Brittany. Appreciate you setting Thanks, it up. John and Erica. Have a great Have a day, everyone. Bye.